Let's begin and let's pray. We thank you, gracious and faithful God, that you did not create the world in chaos, but in order. We thank you for your ordering of your world at the beginning and now until the end of time. Thank you that you provide your blessings to us through the order that you've created for us. We pray this day that you will let your blessing rest on us, on this place, on our families, and on your broken creation in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the teaching on creation in the Old Testament you may remember I began by looking at Psalm 89, which makes the point that creation is a miracle. A miracle. Something beyond what's normal, natural human, beyond human ken. Uh, the God creates and upholds his creation through his word. The feature the astonishing feature in Genesis 1 is the various kinds of words that God speaks to either create or to order his creation. There's not just one kind of word. He doesn't just say, let there be. But there's different kinds of words that he spoke then and continues to speak. And uh, by speaking that, continues to uphold his creation. Um, so God continues to uh, uh, empower and maintain his creation by his word. Um, yeah. God's use of his word in creating the world and upholding his creation creates a precedent, and a very important precedent, for the way he will be at work in history. Can you see it's logical? If God, through his word, creates the world, then he works in creation through his word. Now this is fundamental to Lutheran theology. And you won't understand Luther unless you see the importance of this. Philosophically speaking, this gives the ontological foundation for uh, the whole of our faith. That's if any of you are into philosophy. And um, it, if you like, calls into question all existential and constructionist um, philosophies. That's a little philosophical aside. Um, uh, it's God continues to work through his word in human history and most importantly in Israel and in the church. So Luther again very memorably put, says that the church and every Christian is a creature of the word, is created and upheld by the word of God. Um, quite obviously, um, if God creates, is the creator, um, and if creation is a miracle, then we can't have any scientific descriptions or explanations of how God creates. Um, we've got to use analogies. Now, uh, thinking about creation and about all God's activity is analogical. Um, God explains how he works, not in his terms, but in human terms, using human analogies. And all analogies are going to be limited of their very, by their very nature. Um, so, for example, you get the picture of God as the potter. You remember, God takes dust and forms Adam from the dust of the earth and then breathes into that um, the breath of life. That's not a literal explanation. You can't have a literal explanation. That's a picture of God as an artisan, as a potter, uh, forming human beings out of the elements of the earth. You have the picture of God as a craftsman, so besides the use of the verb bara, to create out of nothing, in Genesis 1 and elsewhere you get the use of the word azar, which is the word for 
no, uh, what a craftsman does. Uh, you get uh, the picture of God as a builder and the earth as a house. God founds the earth on foundations. He establishes the earth. Lots of pictures of God as builder and very commonly God as a um, farmer establishing a garden, caring for a garden, um, uh, creating, if you like, a farm. There's many other pictures like that, but always when you have a look at these descriptions of creation, have a look at the pictures behind it if you want to get them uh, most clear and understand what's going on. But also you need to understand that what you have here is uh, human analogies. Now explaining in human terms what ultimately is ult beyond all human understanding. Um, uh, likewise then, what's interesting is that the earth is, the picture that's used for the earth is the mother of plants and animals. Let the earth bring forth plants, let the earth bring forth animals. The uh, hotzi, the verbs that are used there, are the same verbs that are used for a woman bringing forth a child out of her womb. So you get pictures of earth mother, um, but not, uh, not the earth mother as goddess, which is the pagan thing. So there's, there's stuff, pictures that are taken from paganism and reworked, reshaped here. Mother Earth, there's something, certain truth in it but not Mother Earth as creator, but as the receiver of God's created, creative activity. Which leads me to a very important point that you must never ever forget. And that is the doctrine of creation. Creation is as much as a revealed article of faith as the Holy Trinity, the true natures of Christ, etc. It's an article of faith. It's not a scientific premise. It's not a scientific dogma and can never be treated as such. The most you could go scientifically is that the somebody or something must have, or that there was some point in which the earth was created and somebody or something, some force was responsible for it. But even that's difficult scientifically because how can something come out of nothing? scientific nonsense ultimately um, and that's where science comes very much to the limits of its competence or well, it comes to the limits of its competence long before that really but that's its ultimate uh, uh, level of competence. Uh, for us Christians and Jews the doctrine of creation is as much an article of faith as any other and notice that we confess it in our creed as an article of faith let me put it another way. Uh, who alone knows that the world was created, who created the world and how the world was created? Who alone was the witness to creation? God. And so how alone can we have knowledge of creation? Through his revealed word. His revealed word. We can only know about creation if God chooses to reveal it. And as much as God chooses to reveal, so it is the only one who can tell us about it is God himself, in as far as he chooses to reveal it. But you also need to understand the difficulty that God is in. He has to reveal it to us, not in his terms. You can imagine how impossible that would be, but in our terms. Somebody once said um, that uh, the difficulty that God has in telling us, revealing to us the mysteries of creation are the same as um, would be if you were a mother and wanted to tell the child in your womb about the world. Now it's possible to communicate in a very limited way with, by mother, child and womb not, not visually, but in terms of sound and touch. Imagine trying to describe a tree or a flower in sound terms. You'd have to translate it into music, wouldn't you? No difficulty. But can you see the problem? Um, uh, 
we come into deeper and deeper mysteries and to the limits of all human knowledge and understanding. Uh, now, uh, so God alone is witness, he alone can reveal, and he reveals it not in his terms, but in our terms, uh, in terms that make sense to us. Um, uh, again and again, uh, theologians have pointed out, and the Old Testament bears witness to this, and the whole Bible bears witness to this, that the, um, the uh, for the doctrine of the first things, protology, is like the doctrine of the last things. The same sort of mystery which goes beyond human understanding. Just as the only way we can understand what eternal life is like, heaven is like, is by using earthly pictures, so, so that's eschatology, so protology is of the same order. The first things are like the last things. There's no way, imaginatively or rationally, that we can go the other side of the fall because our whole mind, our imagination has been warped and the whole world has been altered irrevocably, no, uh, completely in every part of it by human sin and disorder. Josh. Did you have your hand up? Yes. Yeah, um, there's, there's so much theological debate over the doctrine of creation. Do, do you think that um, our doctrine of creation actually um, has a, a real impact on how we see other yes. um, doctrines in the yes. Bible? Yes. So it is actually really worth the... It's worth the effort. Worth the effort. Yeah. And a lot of the problems that we have in the life of the church and in our society um, come from an inadequate doctrine of creation that's been floating around um, in my generation. Uh, and I don't want to go into that. Uh, that's a big topic and that really goes into the area of dogmatics. Um, but basically an existential doctrine of creation uh, which doesn't do justice to uh, the Christian faith. And just, just, just to big, do big traje trajectories, it um, has to do then with incarnation. It has to do with resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead physically. It has to do with our resurrection. It has to do with the way God works with us through physical means. It has to do with the body and everything to do with the body. And the biggest debates in my lifetime have to, uh, and problems that we've had inside the church, but even more in society, have to do with sexuality. Now, sex is the big topic, for better or worse, uh, since the 50s and 60s. It's always been a big topic but, uh, of interest, but in terms of understanding human sexuality. Unless you have a doctrine of creation, properly, you cannot understand human sexuality and human life, our embodiment. Because there's a strange mystery that I'll come back to a little bit further, that we are embodied creatures. Embodied creatures. We're not pure souls, we're not pure spirits, but we are embodied souls, embodied spirits, and everything that that means. Look, there's so many, uh, it, it, it impinges everywhere. Yes. Just, I really like that. It strikes me too that a lot of people almost try and seek access to God through creation. Yes. In the, whereas in the typical Lutheran way, that's not where God's is. God sent is for us uh, in His sacramental presence. Yes. So He is in creation and He is in the foundation of the world. But people devote their Christian lives to, to seeking Him, His gracious presence there. Whereas yes. it's not necessarily where He promises it in His Word. Yes. That, um, but, yep. but people see that it becomes a sacrament for a lot of the Protestant world as well to try. And, oh, absolutely. That's where we can try and really get this God, you know, yes. rather than looking to the Word. So. And you need to understand the appeal of this for people of your generation, um, which is uh, behind the whole ecological movement mm -hmm. and uh, shapes people's imagination and so on. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have access to God or gods or divine powers by uh, somehow fitting in to the cosmic order. Now you need to get your heads around it. And this is you know, profound thinking that's going on here and very deep thinking that touches people very, very deeply. 
Uh, yes, but Christian doctrine, remember, is that we live outside of Eden. And there's an angel guarding the gate back to Eden. We can't enter. Uh, the God that you find in nature is not God the creator even, or let alone the triune God. There's no way back. And people who've tried it have run into problems. But it's interesting, you can uh, see it on, in people's lives who've tried to go that way and what happens. Uh, ultimately then, to go back to where I stand, uh, started, uh, creation is, primarily, is, is a mystery. And so therefore you cannot communicate the doctrine of creation uh, philosophically or scientifically or even rationally if it is mystery, the only way you can communicate it adequately is with the language of praise. You know, the way it is, you experience something that is out of the ordinary. You, know, you fall in love for the first time, or you have the birth of a child, or some extraordinary event like that. Um, and it's almost impossible to tell others about it. And what you resort to then is praise. Even if it's just, wow! It's the language of praise which communicates mystery. And ultimately, the language of praise communicates the mystery of creation. So there's very little, actually, a, a teaching on creation in the Old Testament. Genesis 1, Genesis 2. But I've given you a whole heap of passages in your notes which talk about creation. Where do we find most of the references to creation, interestingly? In the Psalms, and that's right and proper. So the Psalms praise they do, uh, God as creator, but they also praise uh, God for the wonderful world that he made and still continues to make and uphold. So it is the language of praise that uh, communicates the doctrine of creation most adequately. Um, as the, all the other great mysteries of our faith are best communicated in praise. But any questions? Okay, new topic. Uh, the ordering of the world, God's creation of an orderly world. I remind you of uh, something that you uh, goes back to uh, stuff that you hand we dealt with when we uh, were going doing Bible introduction. Um, what's interesting about Genesis one is not that you have seven days of creation. You don't have seven days of creation because it starts off in the beginning. There's chaos. Tohu va bohu, darkness on the face of the deep. And then day one is the first day in which God creates an orderly world. And you get, as you remember, there's a double order. There's a, a, and it's best expressed, at least I find it's best expressed by means of a pyramid. There's the order of dependence. Okay, so the first thing God cre creates when he orders the world is light with day and night. So time is a creature. Likewise, and this is revolutionary in the ancient world, light is a creature. Do you realize for pagan people light is divine? Sun, moon, stars are divinities. Paganism and neo-paganism um, also is, uh, 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 is the same. Um, so light here is not quite the same as modern scientific understanding of light. It's a bit like energy, or you need to understand that light for, pay, for people in the ancient world was divine power. God creates light. Um, there's a dark world, and he creates light. Then he creates space, the firmament. The picture is of a house with a roof. The firmament is the roof, the dome of the sky. Um, and by 
creating that, then he creates the above and below, the sky and the earth. He creates what, you know, if we wanted to put it in modern terms, space. So you create light, uh, ordered energy, probably energy is, is a better term than uh, light to get you some, your head around it in scientific terms. Remember Einstein, E equals MC squared? Is um, Then, uh, only once he's created space, then you get the separation of the seas and the dry land. Ordering of creation. And then, um, once you have the land, then the land produces vegetation. Uh, and then you have the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars. And you need to know that for people in the ancient world, as for many people presently, with their obsession with astrology, these are divine entities. The sun is the supreme god. Um, and then you have the constellations which determine human life on earth. The sun and the moon and the stars. Now, God creates them. They are creatures. They are not divinities. They're not divine entities. And they have a limited rule. They determine times and seasons. So natural time only begins after the creation of sun and moon and stars. Time in our, in our sense. Then you have the creation of birds for the sky and uh, fish for the sea. It's interesting that those two are connected. And then you have the creation of animals from the land. And then you have the creation of humanity, Adam, in the image of God, um, uh, as the last. And then strangely, paradoxically, you have not another day of creation or ordering, but God's rest. God rests on the seventh day, and he blesses and sanctifies it. One other feature that I'd like to remind you of, that you remember, or should remember, is that, um, uh, or two other features. At the end of each day, you have the recurring phrase, God saw what he'd made, and it was good. But at the end, you get what refrain? God saw everything that he made, and it was very good. Very good. Now, this is going to be very important, and I want to pick that up, because there's a very profound anti-pagan, anti-animist, anti-New Age statement that's being made there. Um, and the second thing is that with each of these seven days, the seven days of God working and resting, uh, uh, you get closure except the last day. First day, evening and morning, all the way up to sixth day, evening and morning, but there is no evening and morning seventh day. The seventh day is open. It's, un it's not closed off. There's something special about that seventh day. Now, notice that there are, there's two fundamental things about the order that God creates here. Um, it's the order of dependence, all the way up to here. You can't have human beings unless you've got animals and birds and fish and sun and moon and stars and land and seas and vegetation, space and light. So you have, it's an order of dependence. An ecological order of dependence. But then on the other way around there's an order of rule and there's three levels of rule here. The first four days culminate in the creation of sun and moon and the stars. Now, for any Babylonian person, any person in the ancient world, where would, and if you ask them to draw a pyramid of the world, where would they put the sun and the moon and the stars? That's where it belongs up here. They'd say, hey, that's the wrong place. This goes up here. Hence astrology. Um, the sun and the moon and stars do rule, but what do they rule over? The way I can see which space. 
Right, everything under them. They rule over this, but what don't they rule over? That. Fish, birds, animals, even humans and God. Um, the second level of rule comes from here. Human beings are, are rule over, not the whole of creation. Human beings don't rule over light. They don't rule over space. They don't even rule over the seas. But they rule over animals and the land, the earth. Um, they rule over what's under them. And then over all you get God's rule. If you like, there's an empty space here waiting to be, uh, waiting to be filled. Um, God blesses the seventh day so that through the seventh day he can bless human beings and his creation. God sanctifies the seventh day so that through human resting with God he can sanctify not just human beings but also his creation. Josh? Yep. Okay, from modern from a modern scientific point of view, this is nonsense. And yet even it's only uh, yet it's not nonsense. Is light created by the sun and the moon and the stars? Created by it? It's generated, it's supplied by the sun and the moon and the stars, but it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's like a generator. Uh, it's not, doesn't create it. Uh, but uh, this is not science. And you need to understand that light here is used in a different sense to um, uh, modern you know, scientific description of, of light. You get much more closely uh, if you see that basically light is very much uh, related to energy, but not naked energy, not, not, not negative energy, destructive energy, but life-giving energy. Um, and much more. You'd, you'd have to study what's meant by light to get the full sense of that. Um, there's another uh, question, which is from our modern scientific point of view, is how can you have a day before you have... Huh. And, you know, the people who wrote this with divine inspiration weren't stupid, they knew that. What's the point that's being made? Sorry, a bit louder? God created the heavens and the earth. And goes more than that. What time is being spoken about here? Whose time? God's time. It's God's time. And you remember that's picked up by Peter, Second Peter, when he says, For God, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years are as one day. This is God's time, in inverted comma, not human time. And remember what I said about analogies? Um, the only way that God can... Uh, uh, reveal the first things to us is by means of analogy. However, that still doesn't uh, explain uh, uh, something else. You could have had, and it would have been logical to have ten days of creation because there are ten words of God. Have you, did you notice that? There's ten words. Why seven days rather than ten days? And ten days is, makes good sense scientifically in the ancient world. It's a complete number, it's digits, you know, two hands, um, a round number, and it fits into lots of uh, uh, aspects of creation. But seven is an awkward number. It doesn't fit in anyway. It's a prime number even. Um, as you know, any of you who've done math mathematics, seven is a very funny number. Um, it doesn't correspond to anything in creation. Why seven days? Yes. It's God's number.
but also then, and how does it become a human number? It's God's number that's not in creation, that's imposed on creation. And what you have here is God establishing something profound. He's establishing a pattern for human life on earth. Not the pattern that's inherent in it, but the pattern that he brings to it. What um, uh, human beings uh, were uh, created by God to work with God and to rest with God. So, uh, what's the purpose of human life? Work and rest. Um, and what's the most important is not work, but rest. Now, that undermines the whole of pagan theology in its modern guises or its ancient guises, because uh, the understanding of uh, pagan people was that uh, the most important thing you did was work. They're good modern people. The two kinds of work that you do, work for yourself and work for the gods. Ritual is God's work. But in Israel you get an established uh, worship or service of God which is an anti-ritual ritual. If I can put it that way. Uh, resting. Doing nothing. We'll come to that. There's something very profound that's been touched on. There's so many very profound things that are here um, that we'll be unpacking as we go through the Old Testament. And we, and we can only skim the surface of it. Yes? It's funny too, how, I've always thought how seven as a week is an odd number. It is. It doesn't actually fit in any natural... That's right. Yeah, it's so prevalent. Everyone, everyone seven-day weeks are quite, you know, now everyone's on a seven-day week. And in the ancient world, it was fiddling around, but seven is common, but it's not based on the lunar or solar. Or any, 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 um, anything in the created order. And uh, it's also, uh, if you have a look at the ancient world, you know, you get other patterns, you know, you get lunar patterns, solar patterns, uh, you get half yearly patterns, uh, quarterly patterns, uh, which fit into, synchronize you with the order of creation, but seven is not a number, holy number, ritual number, uh, cosmic number, anywhere in the ancient world. Do you realize that? If you do comparative religion, seven doesn't fit in. It's an oddity. It doesn't fit in to anything. Um, you, you, you need to understand the basic premise of paganism. And uh, in its new, you, you see it in its new age, developed uh, form, uh, the understanding is that if you'll be healthy and you, you'll be ecologically um, uh, healthy if you can fit in with the cosmic order. Now, the whole ecological movement is harmon living in harmony with the cosmic order. And um, the co most important part of the cosmic order for people in the ancient world was to synchronize yourself with the cosmic time, the cosmic clock. But in its monthly, annual, and its uh, larger cycles, which you find in astrology. You, know, you, get the, you get the movement of the stars, which form the house of the zodiac if you know anything about that kind of stuff. What you've got to do is to synchronize yourself with the physical order, but also the temporal order. And in that way, then you uh, live in harmony with that order and you reap the benefits of it. But the order that God gives, there is a natural order and we need to uh, uh, adjust to it. But in worship, we synchronize ourselves, I can, if I can put, use it that term, not with a natural order but with a supernatural order. Seven is a supernatural order. Hence there's no closure to the seventh day. The rabbis put it beautifully, say the seventh day is a day in time but it's the day of eternity in time. A foretaste of eternity. It's the day without end and yet it is within time. Any other questions on that? I mean, I'm not saying that yeah. oh. what we're saying is, is wrong. I, I agree with you. 
agree with it, but it, it almost feels like we're coming at it from the end, going back towards the beginning instead of going from the beginning towards the end. Am I making myself? No, I don't understand you. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know, I guess by saying seven is a special number. Yes. From, I guess I feel like we're coming at it from the perspective of Jewish numerology rather than from God's perspective of the biblical establishment. Okay, where does it come from? The Jews didn't uh, invent it. Who invented this? Why, why is seven so special within the Old Testament and then in Judaism and in Christianity? Because of Genesis 1. This is the foundational, uh, the foundation for all that. Um, and it's God's foundation. It's not human speculation, if I can put it that way. This is revelation, not human um, fantasizing. Because you see, it's so odd, it doesn't fit, that uh, there's no way that you'd reach it and arrive at it rational, rationally. It's one of those funny oddities. That the more I study the Old Testament, the more it sticks out as being strange and odd. And I'm just trying to make you aware just a little bit of it here. Uh, and um, if ever I want evidence of divine inspiration, this is it. It just doesn't fit your normal, natural way of thinking. So, uh, in fact, what I'm uh, saying is the exact opposite in the way you're hearing me. If that's not unkind. Yeah. Or uh, have I misunderstood your question? No, no. I, I thought that might be the case. I think it might just be more in mindset. And... You wanted it confirmed. Yeah. But could, can you understand the point I'm making? I, yeah, I think so. It's the opposite of that. Yeah. Um, and you'll find this again and again um, at various points. And at various points I will be drawing parallels between um, the Old Testament and its environment because um, not uh, to make a sort of an evolutionary case saying this is where they borrowed it from, but it's very often most evident if you see things against. You know, God is not, doesn't just speak into a situation, but he speaks against things in a situation. And that against help and, helps to define the is uh, very, much more sharply and clearly. And in your preaching, will have greatest power if it not only speaks the truth, but speaks the truth over against what is political correctness or sociological correctness, what is people regard as being self-evidently true in our society. Most things that are self-evidently true are rather dubious, by the way, and have very flimsy foundations, if you probe it at any length. Any, does that... You come back to it again. Okay. Yeah. Um, right, now, um, uh, I want to summarize uh, uh, the data from here and beyond. Now, my basic contention is that uh, uh, the Bible is not interested in showing us uh, by what means God created the world or when God created the world. But the fact that God created what kind of a world? An orderly world. An ordered world. Now that is quite astonishing um, against its in, within its environment, although these days would take it as being self-evidently true without realizing where it comes from. Now, to understand um, the following, um, you need to understand the particular significance of a number of key terms, all of which go beyond uh, you know, naturalistic terms. These are mythological, theological terms in the ancient world. Um, you know, uh, there was darkness, Genesis 1 says, over the face of the deep. Just as light is more than light, but it has to do with uh, life-giving, life-sustaining order. So darkness is more than just the absence of light. Darkness everywhere in the ancient world is seen as a negative power. You could say demonic power. So it's a power. And it basically has to do with uh, chaos. 
So if you wanted to get the <sighs> The closest that I can get to it, although it's not exactly right, is demonic darkness. It's demonic darkness, which is also physical. Now, darkness was over the face of the deep. Um, uh, deep, uh, you could just understand as being sort of a natural phenomena within nature. That's not it. It's the abyss. The abyss. The underworld. So which brings you, you have the underworld at various layers. The abyss is the very bottom of the underworld. Chaos of chaos. The abyss. Tekhom. Darkness was over the face of the tekhom. Um, oh, and going here. This should have been up here. Um, and the earth was what? Formless and void is the way it's translated. A lovely Hebrew phrase, tohu vabohu, tohu vabohu. The earth was tohu, formless, shapeless, chaotic, disordered. So disorder is basically, the earth was disorder, um, anarchy, chaos. Uh, to, that's tohu. Vabohu has the idea of void, empty, um, uh, uh, lacking its contents. So you have the two things here that you have uh, the earth being shapeless, unstructured, disordered, and because it's shapeless and, uh, and disordered, then it doesn't, it's not full of ordered content. No? These are uh, cosmogonic terms, very important. So in both of these, there are uh, element of uh, expectation of what should be there. Yes, both of these expect. Uh, if you'd say something is shapeless... It points to having shape. Having shape. The goal is to have shape. Have shape. It's not, it's not bad in itself, but it is the first step towards being shaped. You know, you have clay. The potter takes clay, it's shapeless, and what does a potter do? Orders it, shapes it. You have a pile of bricks out there, they need to be put into a building. And that's that kind of thing. So these are not necessarily negative terms, they are neutral in themselves, um, but uh, even though they are, uh, have to do with chaos. So chaos in itself is not bad. Um, uh, it's this stuff that's the problem. Um, then um, uh, Mayim, the waters, and you get it uh, in Psalms and elsewhere quite often in terms of, I've mispointed this. Tut, tut. Mayim Ravim, the many waters, which are the chaotic waters. Um, I don't know if you've come across that Psalms and elsewhere, the many waters. Um, uh, uh, so waters, Mayim, is not just the sea. It is that, but it goes beyond that. The sea represents and is chaos. The chaos of the underworld. No, um, the earth floats on the sea. Um, the sea is uh, chaotic, disordered. Okay, so you get that term, Mayim, and then you have Yam, the sea. Now, in um, uh, the Middle East, in a picky in the land of Israel, um, uh, nobody can hear the word Yam, sea, without being reminded of Canaanite religion, Canaanite mythology. The Canaanites had three classes of gods, uh, I'll just give you the most important. There's El, who is the supreme god. Then there's Baal, who is the sky god. You have Asherah and Anat, which are, are female deities, earth mothers. And then you have the two key gods of the underworld, Yam, sea, and his crony, Moth, death. And also, uh, 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 Yam, and moth are very closely related. So uh, disorder, I mean chaos and death, uh, very closely related. Just as light and life 
uh, virtual synonyms. And then you have uh, um, something that's translated, I think, in 121 as the great sea creatures. Now that's um, really sanitizing it. A tanim is a snake or a serpent and therefore a monster and ultimately a sea monster. And there's two names that are given to the sea monster, the chaos monster, the underworld monster. There is the um, Canaanite term Leviathan, the great serpent. Um, and then there is Rahab, the chaos monster from Egypt, quite often identified either with crocodile or with hippopotamus in Egyptian mythology. And these are chaos monsters. Now what God does, he doesn't eliminate chaos or disorder, he orders it. So God doesn't eliminate darkness, but he orders darkness so that you have day and night. Um, God doesn't uh, eliminate the abyss, but he establishes rakia, the sky, and the land, and the sea, um, over the abyss. But the abyss is still there, if you like. Abyss is a bit like, um, the ancients would have understood it, something like, in modern physics, the black holes. You know, black holes which suck in everything. Um, so the abyss is the black hole in creation. But God orders it. Um, the waters, which originally covered everything, are put in their place and they are ordered in such a way that they water the land without destroying life on the land. Um, God puts the sea monsters, the monsters, um, the monsters which used to crawl over the land or were everywhere, he puts them back into which place? The sea, where they belong. Um, they are not allowed on the land. They're put in their place. They are defanged, tamed, domesticated. Um, Psalm 104 even says that God uh, uh, created the sea monsters to play with, as playthings. Lovely picture. You know, completely turning around um, stuff from the ancient world. And what does God do with tohu, disorder? He orders it, but it's still there. What we have is ordered chaos. Um, what does he do with the emptiness, the void, the vacuum? He fills it and fills it with good things, fills it with life. Okay, let's have a break and then I want to take you through the various orders and the various kinds of ordering that we have in particularly in Genesis 1, well, I'll go a little bit beyond that in a few places, but just Genesis 1, what kind of an order, an ordered world did God create? And it's very, very profound.